I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> when I was 25, my mom was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. My dad's job ended, so he had to go do locum tenens out of town. So I became my mom's primary caregiver while working full time at a group home for children in Indiana. And during those, I guess it was about um, six or seven years, um, even as young as I was, it was exhausting to work full time. My mom was in and out of the hospital all the time and she wanted to be in Indianapolis. So that was an hour away from home. So often I would go to work and in the evenings, then I would go visit with her in the hospital and then come back another hour um, before going to bed and doing it all over again. So about, I don't know, about 30, <laughs> uh, I was exhausted. I was depressed. I had double pneumonia. I had never been so sick in my life. So I, I know just a little bit about uh, caregiver burnout and, um, and the toll it takes on you emotionally and uh, spiritually, physically, and cognitively. So I was very happy to talk about that today. Um, just introductory. I don't know if you know all of the lines of service that Bluegrass offers, but one of them that's relatively new is Bluegrass Home Primary Care. So if you are the caregiver of, you know, a parent or um, an elder adult who has real difficulty getting out to the doctor, you can now have a primary care doctor come to you. And um, we just get rave reviews about Dr. Skarupa. She's, she's awesome. So I just wanted to let you know about that resource. Um, and I wanted to talk about caregiving, but I also wanted to talk about specifically caregiving during the pandemic because this really has changed the resources that are out there and available to support caregivers. So we kind of have to start thinking outside the box. Well, this talk is for you if you fit into one of these categories. <clears throat> Rosalind Carter wrote, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been a caregiver, those who are currently, oops, let me go backwards, currently a caregiver, those who uh, will be a caregiver, and those who will need a caregiver. But I would also add those who support caregivers in their job or volunteer work. So as you see, there's, there's a poll going out, <clears throat> and I would fall under, I have been a caregiver, <clears throat> and 50% of us are currently caregivers. So we have been, um, or are going down similar paths. Get that pull out of my way. Um, so for our purposes, a caregiver is, <laughs> I, that poll keeps popping up, I'm gonna have to move it. Uh, a caregiver is somebody who um, is an unpaid individual. So in the literature, they're often referred to as informal caregivers. Um, so it could be a spouse, partner, family member, friend, or neighbor. And these folks often assist with activities of daily living like bathing, dressing, uh, feeding, and all other medical tasks. Former, formal caregivers are those who are paid. So your CNAs, your um, you know, home, home health nurse kind of position, um, okay, Terry, could you take off the poll? It keeps popping up in the yep, middle. Sorry of the about that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so for our talk, we are going, I'm going to say caregiver, but we are talking about informal caregivers, not paid caregivers. So just a rough estimate, and I'm sure these numbers have gone up since the coronavirus, but I don't have anything newer than say um, 2017 or so. So as of 2017, there were 50.3 million adults who were giving care to other an adult, other adult or adult children, excuse me, other adults or children with special needs. That's up from 2016, um, just, just under 7 million 
the typical family caregiver is a 49-year-old woman. Only 40% of caregivers, according to this study, were men. The loved one give, being cared for is typically a woman who is 69 years of age. Now this is amazing. These 50.3 million adults put in so many hours of caregiving that it's worth, or was worth in 2017, $470 billion worth of free healthcare. That is a lot. Um, the average out of pocket for that same year was like roughly 300 some billion. So the in, informal caregivers gave more care than most people, well, than the rest of the United States spent out of pocket in medical bills. So most studies show that there are equitable distributions between male and female caregivers, around 60, 40, um, or 40, 60, I should say, male to female. But the female caregivers tend to spend about five hours more per week than their male counterparts. Um, those who spend more than 21 hours a week are nearly four times likely to be caring for a spouse or a partner. The AARP sends out state caregiving surveys and they found that um, of those who are 40 or 45 years or older are typically women caring for a parent. Um, but they also found that they do tasks, you know, these medical or more medical tasks like bathing, feeding, um, and nursing, but they also are employed. Many of them have been employed at the same um, time. And so they have home, like their own family, they have their caregiving task, and they have their employment. Um, so like I said, when I was 25, I, I was there. I didn't have a family of my own other than my parents, but I had work and caregiving to take care of. I wondered how many of you are currently employed um, and how many uh, work or how many hours you work. There's going to be a survey coming out in just a minute if will you be, yes. uh, don't mind answering that. Does everybody see the survey? Can everyone see the? Yeah. Um, of the two that have answered, they're working 40 or more hours a week. So the majority of the participants today um, are working a full-time job. OK. Let's go ahead yeah, and end that polling. So um, caregiving is difficult just because of the job, but also because of all of the multiple responsibilities that um, caregivers have to uh, address. So I wanted to talk a little bit about caregiving and COVID-19, three primary targets, caregiver stress, caregiver isolation, and then finally support. So, family caregivers who reside with the person that they provide care for spend on average 40 and a half hours per week. That's a full-time job. But unlike, you know, those of us who go to work and come home, we don't leave caregiving. It, it, you're living with the person. So if it's the middle of the night, you get up. If it's, for, you know, before sunrise, you get up and you never... Um, at least right now, you're not getting a break much um, because those respite care agencies aren't available. Um, imagine being 75 and being a caregiver. On average, you're providing 34 hours a week. So you're, you're retired, but you're working essentially a full-time job. And the average duration of a caregiver's role is four years. So again, imagining working you know, 30 to 40 hours a week on caregiving, maybe on top of a regular job, um, and that goes on for four years. You really um, have a hard time getting away. There's a lot of um, stresses 
um, like anticipatory grief. We talk about anticipatory grief as um, it's just like grief, except it happens before the death. So as the loved one is getting sicker and sicker or, or their memory or dementia is getting worse, you're grieving the relationship that you had and you're anticipating the loss. Burnout um, is a progression of feelings. It's generally um, going from, you know, you're very enthusiastic in your position as a caregiver um, to feeling kind of frustrated, fatigued, all the way to apathy, that you just have nothing else to give. Compassion fatigue comes on suddenly, and it's like you've just hit that emotional wall that you can't go on any further. And burnout and compassion fatigue are different, and they have different um, treatments. Um, but in the slides that we'll get to in a few minutes um, on well being, um, I think if you are taking care of yourself, filling your emotional, social, um, physical, and spiritual bucket, um, you can help um, delay or prevent these two. Ambiguous loss was uh, coined by Dr. Boss. Um, her research on this um, is that ambiguous loss has no clear ending. She wrote, um, loving a person with dementia in real life has no clear ending, and that is our real challenge, to stay empathetic, to stay empathic and connected in a real life story that remains ambiguous. But then <clears throat> there's, if unchecked, there's, you know, mental health risks, there's physical health risks, the more stress we're under, the more likely we are to become ill. Like I mentioned at the beginning, I had double pneumonia after having had uh, the pneumonia vaccine. Um, we know that we're more accident prone, there's lots more accidents or near misses in car. Um, loss of confidence, making mistakes at work, um, we can get uh, developed digestive issues, substance and alcohol abuse can go um, unchecked, um, and it impacts our memory and, and our ability to think clearly. Only thing that I would add to this stress model here, again, is spiritual, um, because it, you know we're both, or we're all physical, emotional, um, and spiritual. The reason why I think the pandemic um, has put additional stress on the caregiver is that um, our typical supports are no longer there. Our family, friends, and neighbors who would normally assist us in caregiving are social distancing in order to protect us. So it's that two it's that two edged sword. Is if they come and expose you to COVID, you know, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. Brief respite care centers such as an adult daycare center or short term skilled facilities um, are either closed or it's just not safe to send your loved one there. And houses of worship who generally have um, very active senior uh, programming are either not meeting or only meeting online. And the elder population just may not have the resources or the technical skills to be able to participate in those um, activities. So there are some risks associated with social isolation and loneliness. Those who are most vulnerable are elderly, people of color, and low income. The risk of premature death because of social isolation and loneliness may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical act inactivity. There's also a 50% increase in risk for dementia. Risks continue. Um, a 29% increase in risk for heart disease, 32% risk increase for stroke. 
Social isolation and loneliness are also associated with higher rates of depression and anxiety. There's also an increased risk for elder abuse, um, financial scams, and family violence. So my way of dealing with caregiver um, well-being is kind of thinking outside the box. And I used the Center for Well-Being at the New Economics Foundation study. It um, was a group of scientists who study what makes people have a sense of well-being versus illness. And it's a uh, multidisciplinary team that came up with evidence-based actions um, to improve a sense of well-being. So I incorporated their research into creative ways to think about caring for our caregivers. Their five actions include give, keep learning, connect, take notice, and be active. We're gonna go through those one by one. We'll look at a little bit of literature as to, you know, partially why um, these actions were supported. And then we'll think of some creative ways we can incorporate this in how we care for our caregivers. So the uh, New Economics Foundation says of connect with the people around you, with families, friends, colleagues, and neighbors, at home, work, school, or in your local community. Um, think of your connections as cornerstones in your life and invest time in developing them. Building these connections will support and, and enrich you every day. The literature, the scientific literature also supports this. We have decades worth of research that tell us that relationships and social support are critical to resilience. And resilience is what helps us get through those tough situations. So we have to be kind of creative right now. Um, obviously there's phone call, Facebook or other social media, Zoom, but again, social media and Zoom may be difficult for an elderly population if they don't have internet or don't have the technology or know how uh, to use it. We have porch or window visits um, with appropriate social, social distancing. Um, the old fashioned letters or cards, <laughs> virtual support groups and window art message. So this was an example of um, a happy birthday window art that someone put up for an elderly person in a nursing home because she couldn't have visitors on her birthday. Um, so that, you know, it wouldn't have to be necessarily birthday. You could just go and write on your loved one's window. I love you. I miss you. I'll call you and, you know, change it up every couple of days. Um, let's see. Virtual group ideas. So it would be kind of like teaching someone how to get on Zoom. Um, or some other friendly app. And maybe maybe there are four or five of you and you would drop off art supplies um, for, a, for a specific art project you have in mind. And then you would get on Zoom and you would complete this art project together and you could hold up you know, your art for the camera and everybody could see how everybody else interpreted that art project. There are some museums who are, who are giving um, virtual art museum tours. Um, you could enlist the help of a music therapist who could lead you in some music therapy, could read books and poetry together. You could have someone come in to talk about um, exercise or health content. There's therapeutic writing and mindfulness. We'll get into mindfulness a little bit later, so I won't go into it right now. We, or I looked at um, the benefits of social group interactions and the circle of friends is based on a live face-to-face -face because this was created before the pandemic. But I think you could probably do something similar virtually. But based on the circle of friends program, these groups met weekly for three months. 
And afterwards, there were self-reported decreases in isolation, loneliness, along with increased feelings of well-being. The other thing is that they noticed that there were decreased healthcare costs on the folks who participated in this group. So they were getting their needs met with um, other people. They didn't necessarily need to go visit the doctor um, to manage their illness or symptoms. So the next step um, is to be active, obviously dancing, walking, whatever you are able to do. And the literature and research shows us that mild to moderate, moderate exercises reduce stress hormones in the body. So simply a 20 minute walk a day, a moderate walk a day can reduce um, the stress hormones in your body, can improve depression and decrease anxiety. Exercise also improves the sleep-wake cycle, which is really important in managing your stress. So how can we do that during a pandemic? We might need to find DVD-based exercises like the Walk Away the Pounds, which is a really low impact um, exercise video. Um, dancing to the music that you love. It could be in your chair if you're not mobile. It could be upright. Add singing to your dancing and you're getting more um, benefits from the activity. There are virtual exercise classes. Um, my mother-in-law, who's 77, will walk around the dining room table when she's taking breaks from different activities. And believe it or not, she can get 10,000 steps just by walking around her dining room table hundreds of times. Um, be creative. Um, use your, you know, your canned goods for your weight lifting. And there are simple yoga activities that you can do from a chair um, or, uh, you know, sitting on the floor if you're able to get up and down on the, on the floor still. Taking notice, and this is where I kind of put in that mindfulness piece of it, but being curious. Don't forget to smell the roses. Take time to enjoy the very moment that you're in. And I love this picture with the dog on the right. He's enjoying just the sunshine, the walk being with his owner, where the owner has got all of this stuff going on in his mind. You know, the dog is enjoying the walk a lot more than the owner. So how can, you know, I, I can't go into a whole lot about mindfulness because that's a whole other talk. But mindfulness is just a way of taking ourselves out of automatic pilot. And by automatic pilot, I mean, have you ever been maybe at work at the grocery store and you're driving home, you have no idea how you got home. You don't remember stopping at stoplights. You don't remember passing anything, but you know, one minute you're at the grocery store, the next minute you're at home. That is automatic pilot. And it's, it's helpful for you know, certain things, like I don't wanna have to walk, walk across the room and have to think about every bone and muscle I need to move. Automatic pilot's fine for things like that, but it's not great for everyday activities. Um, just sitting there mindlessly watching TV or mindlessly eating your dinner, you don't even know what you've had or what you've watched. So in this um, longitudinal study about mindfulness, even people who, who weren't like everyday practicing mindfulness skills, but they were kind of practicing them occasionally, had significant increases in problem-focused coping, which predicted well-being. So if you don't know anything about mindfulness, I suggest um, you know getting some books or apps. There's lots of apps um, on for download on your phone or tablet. Most of them have a free component and a paid component. I would say try the free one. There are some that are more neutral. There are some that are faith-based. You just kind of play around with it. Um, there are some free and some paid mindfulness training courses on the internet. Um, there are books on mindfulness. Um, that I'm looking at um, right now is Caring for a Loved One with Dementia 
um, a mindfulness-based guide for reducing stress and making the best of your journey together. So I found this on Amazon. Um, so mindfulness could just be as simple as taking several three to five minute breaks a day just to focus on your breathing, look out the window, see the beauty of the flowers in your back garden, something just to just to be in the moment and not be on automatic pilot. Another way to take notice is a gratitude journal. And there are studies that support that practicing gratitude, one, um, helps decrease anxiety and depression, but two, literally rewires our brain. Um, so I say visual or words. Our integrative medicine um, director is actually an art therapist. And she recommends getting uh, little three by five cards, you know, those index cards that you had to write your school reports on. And on the blank side, drawing or creating a picture. It could be coloring, it could be watercolors, what have you. And just, you know, just whatever's in your head, draw it. And then on the back, maybe use uh, the line side just to kind of describe what you were thinking, describe what you're feeling. So a gratitude journal would be things that you're grateful for, um, past, present, future. Um, and you could make that visual or you could make it in words. And then you just kind of um, store it away for a, a day when you're really having trouble thinking of things to be grateful for. You can go back through your gratitude journal and remind yourself. Keep learning. Um, one, it's good for our brains. It keeps our brains active and engaged, keeps our brains young. But also, um, in the research that I could find, it seems like if you take on uh, a project that you're really interested in, it doesn't wear us out. It actually gives us energy. So even though we're spending energy pursuing that um, new project, we're, we're engaged, we're um, energize and it gives us um, it gives us something to fill our emotional bucket that we can then um, pour out into others lives so ideas for learning of course they're all online at this point but the library is a remarkable wealth of online uh, learning so there are ebooks audiobooks e-magazines comic books you name it there's all kinds of things that you can read or listen to online. Um, there are um, language courses online. Um, there are educational courses. Maybe you want to learn how to do Microsoft Office. Um, but also taking up a new hobby like gardening, knitting, genealogy, poetry. Um, these are some things that you can do to continue learning. So Overdrive, Hoopla and Linda are all um, apps that you can download um, from the Lexington Public Library with your library card. Um, Hoopla has um, music, books, and movies. Overdrive is typically ebooks and audiobooks, and Linda are uh, more of the learning activities. But also, I found um, familysearch.org. It's like Ancestry.com, but it's free. <laughs> so you can start inputting um, your family information on FamilySearch.org and start a genealogy project. And it's something that you can do from your home. And um, it's just quite fascinating. Then there is give. Do something nice for a friend or stranger. Thank someone. Smile. Volunteer. I love this quote by Maya Angelou. I have found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. Ideas for giving. Um, letters of gratitude for someone who believed in you. Don't even have to send it, but just getting it out of, out of your heart onto a piece of paper. Um, stories about your life to give to your family. I call these little Debbie stories. I rented a room in graduate school with a woman named Deborah, and she had a young daughter. And she would tell her young daughter stories about her life to teach her daughter life lessons. And she called them little Debbie stories. 
So I always think about life lesson stories as little, double, little Debbie stories. Uh, pass on a skill that you learned from your grandparents or parents. Um, our, in Indiana, um, instead of dumplings, at least where my parents grew up, we were more into egg noodles. So instead of chicken and dumplings, it would be chicken and noodles. Mm -hmm. And um, that was just something my grandma made from scratch. And I remember, you know, standing by her in the kitchen learning how to make egg noodles and they were so delicious. So passing on a skill like that, because, you know, she didn't write that down in a recipe. She just had it in her head. Maybe make care calls to other people you know might be socia socially isolated. In doing that, you're creating your own social support group um, because then maybe that person will call you back and um, you guys can stay connected that way. There are online volunteering opportunities. I don't have um, the website written down, but if you uh, just Google online volunteer opportunities, there are a ton of them out there. It might be you know, stuffing envelopes, it might be making care calls or whatever. And then obviously um, there's been a huge uptick in people fostering animals from a shelter because they're working from home anyway and they have the time to give to an animal in need. Um, but we also know that the side benefit of having an animal in the home is whenever you pet an animal, your brain releases serotonin, which helps you feel calm and peaceful. If you're feeling overwhelmed, um, connect with others who have talents and skills that are different from your own. Um, I call this filling in other people's gaps, and I got that from somebody else. It wasn't my own. But a son was complaining to his father that his brother had it all. His brother had the looks, he had the academic skills, he had the athletic skills, and this, this younger brother struggled in those areas. And his father wisely told him, son, you have skills that your brother will never have, and he has skills that you will never have. And the reason for that is that you have gaps. And together, you fill each other's gaps. If you didn't have gaps, you wouldn't need each other. And so uh, there are things that I can do that you can't, but there are things, multiple things that you can do that I can't. And we need each other to get through this together. If you don't know how to do something, just ask. That's part of that learning something new um, that can help keep your brain young and keep you active and, and engaged. And this is something that I learned from my pastor. If it's on your heart that people should do something, maybe that's actually your next mission. Because it's not on that other person's heart, and it's not on that person's heart, it's on your heart. So maybe you are being moved to create something or to do something that would benefit um, your family, your neighborhood, your community. Um, so think of it that way versus feeling like it's a burden. Maybe that's your next thing um, to get going. And never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, these are the UK resources for those who are in, in that um, line of work. Um, if you do not work for UK, um, you may have an EAP at your own job, employee assistance program. You would just call your HR department. Um, if you're not employed, but you have insurance and you feel like you're having depression or anxiety, and you think maybe it's time to get some help, um, on the back of your insurance card, there should be a customer service number or behavioral health number. And either one of those could get you going on finding somebody locally that takes your insurance. Um, and most people nowadays are set up to do telemental health if you can't leave the house because you are a caregiver. Um, there are also online resources. Um, Family Caregiver Alliance is a place where I found a lot of information 
there are support groups for specific um, health issues like dementia or cancer. Um, and then there's general information like how to guide kind of for men um, who are maybe new to being a caregiver um, or just general help and information uh, for caregivers from caregivernation.org. These are the references in case anybody wanted to go back through and look um, at some of the studies and information that I gathered. And then we're going to go ahead and close the time um, with uh, questions and answers if anybody has any.